All right, now, of course, in Ezekiel chapter 13, it's not the most uplifting chapter of all. Um, if, and for that matter, the whole book of Ezekiel, you have Ezekiel and Jeremiah tend to be very negative books. There's a lot of judgment of God being proclaimed against the nation of Israel because they had done so many wicked things up to this point. This is where we're at here. But what I want to focus on in this chapter is it, because it's being very directed at lying prophets. And I believe this has been going on throughout all time. It's going on today. But we see these attributes. We see these prophets. Look down at verse number 2 where we first started reading there in Ezekiel chapter 13. Because he's, he's giving this command unto Ezekiel. Verse number 1 says, And the word of the Lord came unto me. Saying, so God's talking to Ezekiel. And this is the word of God. He says in verse 2, Son of man, prophesy against the prophets of Israel that prophesy. And say thou unto them that prophesy out of their own hearts, hear ye the word of the Lord. So God's first thing, he's telling them, look, I need you to preach against these other preachers. And they are preaching out of their own heart. It's basically, they're not relying on the word of the Lord. They're not preaching God's words. They're just getting up and just basically giving their own opinion or saying whatever it is they want to say. And we can find in other places of the Bible, and one of the attributes of, of these false lying preachers is they preach for filthy lucre's sake. They preach for money. That's what they care about. They don't care about the people. They don't care about, about the individuals. They care about themselves. And what, what sells, well not what sells, but what keeps people happy is a very positive message. It's a very, you come in and say, hey, you're doing great. Everything is just fine. You're not going to offend anybody that way. You're not going to ruffle any feathers. You're not going to step on any toes by just every time you have service, every time you're preaching, just saying everything's just fine. Everything in your life is going great. God loves you. It's all good. But see, this is like the Joel Osteens of this world. This is, this is what they do. You never hear someone like that ever talking about sin and God's punishment and his anger and his wrath. Now look, is God love? Of course he is. God is a God of love and he's merciful and long-suffering and praise the Lord for that. And, and he gave us his son, Jesus Christ, because he loves us so much. But that's not all God is. God has anger. He gets angry. The Bible says he's angry with the wicked every day. God has wrath. I mean, God's the one who created the place called hell. He created the lake of fire, a place of eternal torture and torment. And, and I mean, it's a horrible place to even think about, but God's the one who made that place. And God's going to be the one who is sending people to that place to spend an eternity there. We have to understand and get this, this proper understanding of God. And when you have these lying prophets that are just preaching out of their own heart because they just love money and they don't want to offend anyone and they just want everyone to, to feel good so that they can keep on coming back and keep on throwing their money in the offering plate. You know, this is, this is what he's preaching against. It's this type of a prophet that, you know, any church you go to, hopefully, when it comes time for the learning, for the sermons, for the preaching, hopefully it's coming out of this book. Because this is what the Lord is telling Ezekiel. He's saying, look, tell the prophets that prophesy of their own heart, hear ye the word of the Lord. He's saying, you need to hear God's word. And we have God's word today, and God's word is what needs to be preached. This is what we care about. This is what we give authority to. Just because I'm the pastor, my opinion doesn't mean anything if it's not founded in the truth, if it's not founded in God's word. I can say whatever I want, so I'm blue in the face, but if it's not found in this book, it has no authority. But unfortunately, there's too many preachers out there that that's all they do. They just preach out of their own heart. And Ezekiel is being told here to preach against that. Verse number 3 says, Thus saith the Lord God, Woe unto the foolish prophets that follow their own spirit and have seen nothing. And you see, the reason why they're lying prophets, it's not just because they're getting up and, and speaking out of their own heart. It's because they're saying this is what God said. It's one thing to say, Hey, this is what I think and this is my opinion. Right? Right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with having an opinion about something. Nothing necessarily sinful about that. If I'm claiming, well, this is just what I think. 
But if I'm going to stand up here and say this is what God said when God actually didn't say that, now that's very serious. And, and that is a wicked sin. And that's what these prophets were doing. They were saying, hey, thus saith the Lord. This is what God said. And God didn't say that. Look at verse number 6. We're going to jump down a couple verses. Verse number 6, he says, They have seen vanity and lying divination, saying, The Lord saith, and the Lord hath not sent them. And they have made others to hope that they would confirm the word. So they feel like if we get a group of people together, we get others to hope, then just this strength in numbers, we, we can all agree with each other, and then it somehow provides more authority. But it doesn't, because God actually didn't send them. And he says in uh, verse number 7, Have ye not seen a vain vision, and have ye not spoken a lying divination, whereas ye say, The Lord saith it, albeit I have not spoken. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, because ye have spoken vanity and seen lies, therefore, behold, I am against you, saith the Lord God. God is against the lying preachers, the lying prophets today that are going to tell you everything's just fine. And this is what we see here. Jump down to verse number 10 real quick because this is what they were saying. He says, because even because they have seduced my people saying peace, and there was no peace. They're giving them a false message. They're saying, everything's fine. God's not angry with you. God's not going to bring it. Don't listen to that Ezekiel. Don't listen to that Jeremiah. They're kooks. They're these doomsdayers. They think everything's just always bad and wrong all the time. Don't listen to them. Everything's fine. God, loved, God would never do anything against our holy city, Jerusalem. God's with us. We're going to beat this enemy. We're going to send them away because God's with us. And they were lying. And they would say, God said God would be with us. And he wasn't. He was bringing judgment for their wickedness. And they, they weren't preaching what they needed to hear. Now, is every sermon here a negative sermon? No, of course not. But we need them. We need to hear them from time to time. We need to hear when we're in error. We need to hear when we're doing wrong. If these people, if the people of Jerusalem had been hearing messages saying, look, God's angry with you because you're sinning, because you're doing all this stuff wrong. God's going to bring his judgment against you. That would at least give them the opportunity to change and, and to repent and to say, okay, well, if God's really angry with us, maybe we should change what we're doing so that Maybe he won't destroy us. Maybe, maybe we can stop this judgment from coming, which has happened in many instances throughout the Bible. Jonah, the book of Jonah is a great example with the city of Nineveh. God had sent Jonah to prophesy a, a very negative message. He said, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That's the message that God told Jonah to tell the people of Nineveh. Jonah didn't want to do it. He went the other way. God got a hold of them in a, in a very fun way because I the kids love hearing the story about the whale and Jonah and swallow them up and stuff, but that wasn't very fun for Jonah. I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want to be sitting in a whale's belly for three days and three nights. Not at all. And that darkness and slime and seaweed and oh. gross stuff inside of the inside of that whale's belly, I wouldn't want to be in there. But he did for Jonah. But Jonah listened to him and after that he said, okay, you know what? You got my attention, God. I'll, I'll, I'll go and do what you told me to do. So he goes in, and, and it's a huge city. It's not a fun job to tell people, hey, God's going to destroy your city. God is angry with you. People don't generally take nicely to that. Now, maybe they should. They, I mean, honestly, because what he's doing is he's telling them the truth, right? He's saying, look. This is the word from God. God said this. It's going to happen. And he's giving them a warning. But it's not always received that way. Actually, it rarely is. We, that's why we need today, as, as just individuals, we need to have a humble spirit, oftentimes to be able to receive rebuke, receive correction from God's word, so that, look, we're all sinners. We all have areas of our life we need to improve on. When we hear about those areas, we need to be able to receive that and say, okay, you know what, I'm going to change. Instead of getting your feathers all ruffled and saying, ah, I'm never going to go back to that place again because all they do is just talk about what I'm, oh, I'm so bad and all this other stuff. Look, 
First of all, that's probably not the case, but it's usually people just blowing up over like one thing that gets that gets hit on that just happens to be their thing and it and you get really angry and upset. But my point though with Nineveh is that Jonah preached the message and what happened? They repented. The Bible says they repented in sackcloth and ashes. They got right with God. They humbled themselves. They proclaimed a fast. They got on their knees. They got right with God and just were, were just humbling themselves and saying, God, we're sorry. And God saw that. And the Bible says, and God saw their works that they turned from their evil way, or they turned from their wicked way, and God repented of the evil that he thought to do unto them. Their city was spared. God pronounced judgment against them because of what they did. But because they heard, they were warned, and they changed their ways, God said, okay, I'm going to hold off. I won't, I won't destroy you now. Because I like seeing that type of repentance. I like seeing people who will get right. And if the people of Jerusalem, if the people of Israel had heard these types of messages... Maybe they wouldn't have the judgment come either because they would have had more opportunity to get right. Instead of just having one or two preachers, you know, saying that, you have Ezekiel, you've got Jeremiah, you've got these, these random people that, that, are, that are trying to, to tell them the truth, but the vast majority of them, he's saying, they're, they're preaching lies. They're saying everything's fine. They're saying peace be. They're saying, God didn't say that. And they're lying. They're saying, God said everything's just fine. We're going to get to Jeremiah a little bit later. It's the same exact thing. They actually threw Jeremiah in jail. They didn't like his preaching so much, his negative preaching. They just threw him in jail. They're like, I don't want to hear you anymore. You can't, you, we don't want to hear that. You're discouraging all the people. You're going to make us lose this battle because you're just a negative Nancy and you can't say anything good about us. So we don't want to hear you anymore. You're going into prison. But it was the truth. It was God's word. He was preaching the word of the Lord. And too many people today are preaching this message of peace, peace, as our morality in this country goes down the toilet. I, have, I cannot believe the, the acceleration just within the past couple decades of, of the decline of our morality in this country. And just to think that there's still churches out there saying everything's just fine and God loves it. And hey, we need to be more accepting and more tolerant. Let's let the homos in. Let's let all of this wickedness and filthiness abound. And when you have the adultery running rampant, oh, it's just fine. Everything's okay. No, it's not okay. God hasn't changed. A sin is still a sin. God's laws are still what they are. He made them from the beginning. And... and he still gets angry at sin every day. And we can't just sit here and say that these things are fine because they're not. Let's uh, flip over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Because we live in a time where this type of an attitude abounds. This, the, the sin is abounding for sure. But this, this attitude of these preachers who are preaching lies and prophesying and saying everything's just fine when it's not. We're going to see in 2 Timothy 4, verse number 2, the Bible reads, Preach the word. This is instruction from the Apostle Paul to Timothy. He's saying, Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. So, so the, the right way for Timothy to preach is, He's saying you need to preach the word first and foremost, God's word, the Bible. You have to preach the word. He's saying be instant, in season, out of season, whether it's popular or not. Whether the things found in God's word are popular, mm. preach it. If it's unpopular, preach it anyways, in season and out of season. And then he says reprove. What's reproving? It's telling someone that they're wrong. What's rebuking? Telling someone that they're wrong. And exhorting. You're giving someone, you know, an exhortation to, to do something that's actually not quite as negative as the reproving and rebuking. But he says, with all long suffering and doctrine. And again, the doctrine is important. It's coming from God's word. It's coming from the truth. Verse number three. Why does he have to preach this way? Why? For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. 
as our society becomes more wicked, you're going to find a lot more of these false prophets arising because they're in demand. Because as the wickedness gets worse, these people are going to come, the time's going to come when people are not going to endure sound doctrine. They don't want to hear it. People like so, when, when, when you get into a lot of sin, you don't like to be told you're wrong. You don't want to, what you want is someone to tell you that everything you're doing is just fine. You want someone to tell you, even though you know you're in sin, you want someone to tell you, you know what? No, God's really not mad with you. Your sin's fine. You're just okay. Keep doing what you're doing. They want someone to confirm that with them. So they have these itching ears. They're saying, okay, I need you. You, come over here. We're going to put you behind the pole. We want you just to, to tickle my ears a little bit. I want you to, I got an itch over here. Can you scratch that for me? Oh yeah, that feels good. Thanks. And they go out and, and nothing ever changes in their life. They keep doing what they're doing, keep getting worse and worse. And as this happens in our society, it's just kind of this cyclical effect. It's a snowball effect where people get more wicked, more false prophets are here because they've got more people to, to spread their lies to and just teach his falsehood to. And as a result, no one's going to change. Things, people aren't going to be hearing the truth. And it's just going to be getting worse and worse. And that's why we need preachers to be able to stand up and say, you know what? No, that's a lie. We're going to preach God's Word. We're going to do it the way that the Apostle Paul told Timothy to do it. We're going to preach God's Word. Not just whatever I think out of my own heart. I'm going to preach what the Bible says. Turn, if you would now, please, to... Um, well, go to, go to 2 Peter chapter 2. I'll read from you. So you know, I've got a lot of scripture here. I'm going to read for you from Isaiah 30. But turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. It's real close. Isaiah 38 says, Now go, write it before them in a table and note it in a book that it may be for the time to come forever and ever that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord, which say to the seers, See not, and to the prophets, Prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things prophesy deceits. That's just lies. So they're asking people literally to just Boom. preach lies unto us. This is what we want to hear. And there's a lot of people out there. They're not interested in the truth. But hopefully that's what's one of the things that's different about us. I'm interested in people who are interested in hearing the truth. I love the truth. I want to know what the truth is. We have the truth in God's word. If I'm doing something in error, I don't want you to lie to me just to make me feel better, because, just to make my feelings not get hurt or something. I'd rather, I'd rather get offended or whatever, you know, hear something that I don't want to hear because I'm wrong, but ultimately I do want to hear it because I want to be right with God. I don't want to live my life doing things against God, especially just not knowing, like ignorantly. Just um, every day in and day out, I'm sinning against God and I don't even know it. How terrible would that be? I, mean, I don't want to do that. I love God. I want to serve Him. I want to do the best I can for Him. So if someone can tell me, hey, you're doing this wrong. Brother Dave, you're doing this. You, you know, God's not pleased with what you're doing here. If that's coming out of His Word, I definitely want to hear that. I want to know that because I want to do what's right. And this is one of the things that we're all about here is, is being able to just find the truth in Scripture and this is what we love. This is what we cling to. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes it's things that we, we don't really want to hear even though we do. We, we want to hear it, but we don't. because <laughs> We like to have this vision that, that everything I do is just great and wonderful in God's eyes. Of course. Because that's the goal. I mean, that, that's where you want to be. But that's not always the truth. You know, we want to know the truth above something that's just going to make us feel good for, for a little while. We want to know that, that we really are pleasing in God's eyes. So we're going to turn to his scripture and to his words to hear that. You're in 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2 is a chapter that gives us all, all about uh, the false prophets. All kinds of characteristics. And I'm not, we're not going to read the whole chapter, definitely for sake of time. But look at 2 Peter chapter 2 and look at Jude. Okay, these are, these are two um, chapters that, that basically cover the same topic. And um, they're parallel chapters, basically. Look at verse number one of, of 2 Peter chapter 2. The Bible reads, 
But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. So he's saying, look, there shall be false teachers among you. There's going to be false teachers. They're going to, privily means like privately. They're secretly going to be bringing in their damnable heresies. They're going to be subtle about it, just like Satan is. They're, they're going to bring in these, these false doctrines and these heresies, even to the point of denying the Lord that bought them, is what he says. And bring upon themselves swift destruction. Verse number two says, And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. They don't care about the truth. They don't want to hear the truth. They're, they're preaching lies. And um, they're going to deceive many people. And this is a warning in, in, from, from Peter in the second epistle in, in chapter 2. Look at verse number 3. He says, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. And this is where you start to get more into the heart of the false prophet, of what they're really all about. Through their own covetousness, their greed, their want, their desire for money and for other things and things that they don't have, shall they with feigned words, so they're going to be faking it, they're going to be saying things that they think you want to hear, they're going to make merchandise of you. They don't care about you. They're just looking to make money off of you. Whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Jump down to verse number 18. Because we're just kind of look at some of the dangers, why these, why false prophets are dangerous. I mean, we really, um, it, it needs to be addressed. We need to understand that these false prophets exist. See some of the attributes of the false prophets, so that we could be aware of them, so that we don't get sucked in to their lies, um, and that we're not one of the ones that follow their pernicious ways. Verse number eighteen says, "For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh." Through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. So they use, they allure through the lust of your own flesh. And by being able to say, hey, you know, there's no problem with going out and, you know, drinking some beer and drinking some wine and, you know, doing this other stuff. They're alluring to the lusts of, of whatever people's sinful flesh is telling them that they should be doing and saying, hey, this is just fine. No problem. Go out and do whatever. Do whatever makes you feel good. God loves you anyways. Hey, man, we're free in Christ. We, we don't have to worry about these laws anymore because, you know, everything, the law is basically just done away. I mean, some people have this attitude that, you know, we shouldn't be reading out of the Old Testament anymore because, you know, which is it's old. just, yeah, it's old. That's the old covenant. Why, why do we need to worry about that anymore? Those are just some old laws. God's not angry like that anymore. That's how it used to be. No, it's not. God doesn't change. God doesn't change. Look, this is the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. You think we should just throw this away? This is no... I don't think so. No. We're not going to throw that away. The whole, the whole counsel of God is what we're going to look at. The Bible says that all, all um, Scripture is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. All, doctor, all, all Scripture. Not just the New Testament. It's all Scripture. We need to be following all of it. But... Um, it says in verse 19 of 2 Peter 2, it says, While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought in bondage. We need to watch out for these false prophets because they truly are dangerous. Also, watch out for these people who say, I've heard this quite a bit, and I heard it um, recently at a, at a funeral service that we were at. Now, the, the preacher did say, give a, give a good testimony about salvation, which was actually nice to hear, that it was a free gift. But one of the things he says, and, and I think oftentimes people hear things and tend to repeat them without thinking about them very much, and, and they tend to use words that they shouldn't be using. Um, but when people say, I got, this, I got this word of knowledge from the Lord, or, or God spoke to me and he told me, and then you say something. Now, I understand when people, sometimes when people say that, what they mean is that they felt led somehow through the Spirit to, to, to do something. 
I get that. But we need to be careful with what we say because did God speak to you like he spoke to Ezekiel and said, Son of man, say thou unto the prophets that prophesy lie my name? Because he didn't do that. So when you go around saying, well, God told me this when God didn't say that, be careful with that. Again, I mean, you can have the best intentions. And we went over this last week in our, in our story with Genesis with Cain and Abel. You know, Cain had good intentions with God, yet his offering was not accepted. You can have good intentions and still sin, and God can still be angry with that. Okay, sinning through ignorance isn't an excuse he still holds us responsible for our sins. So be careful with the things that you say, but not just the things that you say, but be careful about what, what prophets, you're, you're, what preachers you're listening to. When you go to church and he's saying, yeah, you know, I was reading the Bible and God told me this. Now, if, if he says God told me this and then he's like reading the Bible, well, that is God's words, right? But if he's just going to say God told me my daughter's going to grow up and she's going to be, you know, whatever, you know, doing this or doing that. God didn't say that. Okay. God's words are all right here. We have, we have a complete word of God. Watch out for the people that want to add to Scripture and just, just say they have these words of knowledge and they just think that, that what they say is um, just coming straight from God. This is how... The Catholic Church operates with their popes. They think they get these words from God and they're able to just pronounce whatever they're saying out of their own heart and say, this is from God. And now we have new rules and now we have new laws and now we have to follow this. If God said that this is okay and God said that that's not okay. The Mormon Church is the same exact thing. And Joseph Smith is one of the biggest phonies. And it's sad, it's, it, it really is sad that so many people have been deceived by such a charlatan, but they have. And, and I mean, especially when I'm down in Phoenix, you know, we lived in a neighborhood where almost, where vast majority of people are Mormon and they are really hard to get through to. They are, they are really hard to preach the gospel to and to get through to and, and to, to just get them to see that they're believing a lie. And, you know, there's lots of different approaches, but it's real difficult because a lot of them are very dedicated to their religion. They're very dedicated to what they believe. Their family has brought them up. You know, all of their friends and family, they go to this church. So it becomes this cultural thing to them where it's very difficult to get through to them. But it's so obvious. Joseph Smith was a charlatan. And we got to watch out for these guys because he was able to deceive quite a few people. There's one, there's, there's, a bolt, there's many ways, I have in my notes, there's one way we know Joseph Smith was a fraud. There's many ways we know Joseph Smith was a fraud. But I'm going to go over just a few of them um, real quick. I just singled, singled him out. I singled out um, you know, the, the Mormons for this sermon. I'll pick on someone else later, don't worry. But um, <laughs> Deuteronomy chapter, you know, if you would turn to Deuteronomy 18. I'll give you just a minute to turn there. Because this does give us indication on whether or not God truly is speaking through people, because they still think it's not just Joseph Smith. They think that there's always a prophet. Then since Joseph Smith, you know, Brigham Young and all these other, you know, of their, of their so-called great prophets that have been throughout time, even to this day, I don't know what the guy's name is today who's supposedly the prophet of, of the Mormon church, but they believe that they get these revelations from God and that they are literally speaking God's word. But Deuteronomy 18 gives us a very good way to judge whether or not a prophet is truly speaking God's word. Deuteronomy 18, verse number 18, says, I will raise them up a prophet. This is talking about Jesus Christ. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? So he tells us, saying, okay, 
you know, I'm going to send my prophet. I'm going to put my words in his mouth and he's going to speak unto you. And if you don't hear those words, if you don't receive them, then you're going to, it's going to be required of you. Okay? But he says, but then he's saying, but these other prophets that are claiming to be from God or they're speaking in the name of other gods, he's saying, don't listen to them. And he's saying, okay, well, now you're asking yourself, well, how do I know the difference? How do I know that this is actually coming from God and this is not? So he gives us this in verse number 22. He says, When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. So if a prophet's preaching in the name of the God, and he says, this is going to happen, and it doesn't happen, you know for sure that God didn't send that person. Because everything that God says comes to pass. If he's going to prophesy something, you know, that did not come from God. And Joseph Smith, as, as our example, our poster boy today for, for false prophets, he's made multiple pro false prophecies. Now, I am not some expert in the Mormon religion. I know enough about them through talking to people at the door and just a little bit that I've read and stuff. And I was out soul winning about a week ago and I ran into this guy. Was it like last week we ran into that guy who was Mormon and we we're kind of yeah, going back and forth. And at first the conversation was going okay and um, I thought he seemed to be kind of listening. And you know, I don't like to just bang my head or get in arguments with people when they're just dead set in their religion. Okay, look, I'm going to try to, to persuade them and show them why, why they're an error from the Bible or show what the Bible says. And if they reject it, fine. But if they're listening and, and, and we're having a good discourse and, and they're, they're being open to hearing what I have to say, then great. I'll, I'll continue the conversation with them. But um, as the, the conversation was just kind of getting worse and worse as far as as far as trying to get through to this man um i just brought up the fact that that you know joseph smith he prophesied the second coming of jesus christ like in his lifetime that didn't come to pass we know that he's not a prophet of the lord when he's prophesying that the, the the second coming of jesus christ in his lifetime it didn't happen we know it didn't happen this is i mean he was around like 100 years ago and it's the same thing, you know, the Watchtower organization, they've prophesied his coming like, I don't know, seven times or ten times already now. And, you know, a lot of these other cult religions out there have done the same thing. Um, but so after that, I didn't really know enough about, about all of the prophecies that Joseph Smith made that were wrong because I don't need to know him. I know that he's a false prophet. I know that they're teaching, they're, they teach a works-based salvation that you have to do good. Look, that goes against scripture immediately. I don't have to know all of these other things to know that what they're teaching is false and it's wrong and it's not of God because it contradicts what the Bible already says. But I did look up a few of them just because I was interested in kind of preparing for this sermon. He, um, <laughs> besides the, the, the false prophecy regarding the second coming of Christ, he also prophesied that all the nations would get involved in the United States Civil War. The American Civil War was going on. He, he prophesied that all the nations of the world were going to be involved in this battle. Well, we know that that didn't happen. He prophesied um, that the temple, because they had this, this temple that was going to be built in Missouri, they were building this new temple to God. He said it was going to be built, and it was going to be built in, in Missouri in Joseph Smith's lifetime, but they got kicked out of Missouri before that was even ever able to happen, and Joseph Smith died before that happened either. So that didn't, you know, there, there's, that's just a few of the things. And I looked up. And I tried to find legitimate sources for these too, because they, they're quoting their um, you know, pearl of great price and their um, doctrines and, and um, oh, I'm forgetting the, the names of their, of their official church documents uh, uh, that they subscribe to and they believe in and that they, they consider to be scripture, where it, where it has the, the prophesyings and teachings of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young and all these other people. Um, it's, it's crazy. But there's always some kind of an excuse and, and that, that people, like this man, he gave me this excuse. Said, oh, well, he said, if he lived to be 56, then Christ would come. It's like, no. I mean, I didn't know enough to be like, no, that's not what he said because I, I don't know. But it, it's still, there's all these little loopholes they try to find to, to, to worm out of why he still really is a, a true prophet. But, but 
He's not there. And the people are very convinced. The people just, just it's a, like a blind faith that they have in their leader. But, you know, and this is what we need to be aware of. And this is what we need to watch out for because I think it could happen to everybody. I think that, that we all need to, to, be, to be aware that these false prophets are out there, that there are people who are going to speak lies in the name of the God, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Lord. They're going to be trying to tell you, hey, I'm from God. And God told me this. And, and to some people, it's easy to get sucked into that. We need to understand that we're living in the last days. And we need to be prepared. You don't need to go to a church where every message is telling you that everything is okay, nothing's wrong, everything's just fine, or that's telling you that you don't need to change anything about your life and where they're not really preaching on sin or anything because we do need to change. I, I'm, thank God, you know, I was saved at the age of 20, but for a long time, I still continued doing a lot of things that I had already been doing because I was Still got this flesh. This flesh hasn't changed. This flesh gives me a battle every single day. And when I first got saved, guess what? My flesh was still pretty strong and my spirit was pretty weak because I hadn't fed the spirit. I haven't grown in the spirit. And I tried going to a couple churches sometimes, but I don't know. It uh, didn't seem to take very well. I didn't, I didn't really seem to hear that much. I'll go to churches and it's just kind of like, hear one verse from the Bible and then 20 or 30 minutes of, of stories and talking, which sure, sometimes there was some truth in it, but I mean, there wasn't much Bible being preached. And it wasn't until I got into a really good church where there was a man who was, who was taking God's word and, and proving all things and, and not, only, not only preaching them, but living that way too. Not being a hypocrite, not being a Pharisee saying, you know, oh, you guys need to be doing this, and he's out, you know, doing the exact opposite. And it wasn't until then that I started getting over it. Hey, when I'm hearing about sins in my own life, things that I were do, was doing that I needed to change, that's when I really started to grow. Instead of people being afraid to even mention anything because you might get upset, you might get your feelings hurt, you might leave. Look, I'm going to keep preaching the way that I preach because I love you. Because I want people to grow. Because, is it going to drive some people away? Yeah, it has already. Sometimes it does. But if you're going to ask me to lie to you just so you can feel better about yourself, I won't do it. Because it's not going to help you. We need to just hear the truth. There's a couple I'll think of in particular. There were the, the, the one lady was divorced and the man wasn't. They wanted to get married. So they came to me and were asking me a bunch of questions. They had just gotten saved. But I'm not going to lie to them. Jesus Christ said, the Bible says that, you know, first of all, divorce is wrong. But after you get divorced, if, you're, if your ex is still alive, if your ex-husband, you, you, you're still bound by that law. You can't go and just marry someone else or else you're committing adultery. That's what the Bible says. And, and I showed him the scripture. I said, look, this is what the Bible says. You know, I, I, I empathize because it's not what you want to hear. I understand that. You're young. But this is what the Bible says. And I can't lie to you. You need to hear the truth. And they, I mean, they didn't end up coming back. But, you know, they needed to hear that. They needed to hear that a lot more. And, and I would not be able to look at myself in the mirror if I just start lying to people because I just want to tell them what they want to hear and just bless them and say everything's going to be okay if you go ahead and do this when the Bible says the opposite. And um, I'm not going to be that false preacher. I, I, I refuse to do it. But um, turn if you would. We were in Deuteronomy 18 last, right? Is that where, is that where you are right now? Flip over, to, um, flip over to Jeremiah 23. I'm going to skip over this, this reference that I have here. Jeremiah chapter 23. 
We need to be on guard. God's people, the born-again Christians, need to be on guard. We need to make sure we're attending a church that's feeding us and, and is preparing you and helping you to grow in the faith and in knowledge and, and, and that you're learning and, and, and again, moving forward, getting, th getting the bad things out, getting the good things in and just growing and trying to get closer, drawing nigh to God so He can draw nigh unto you. This is where we need to be. Jeremiah 23, look at verse number 1 because we're going to see something very similar here. Another story is very similar to what was going on with Ezekiel. Verse number 1 says, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. Therefore thus saith the Lord God of Israel against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them, which shall feed them. And they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. So he's, he's rebuking these pastors, saying, Woe unto these pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. He's saying, you didn't go out and visit them. You're not helping them. You're not doing anything for them. But he says, I'm going to step in and I'm going to make sure that... I will set up shepherds that are going to take care of them. He says that they're not going to have to be afraid or be worried. He says, but, and that there won't be anything lacking. And pastors today need to make sure nothing is lacking in the church, in the flock, um, that all things are covered. All the good things, all the negative things, everything, the whole counsel of God is covered so that nothing is lacking so that we could be the best prepared that we can. There are so many Christians today that are lacking because of the pastors that are not watching out for their flock but are more concerned about the money, about that filthy lucre. You know, the, the soft, easy, positive only messages will keep the majority of people coming back because it doesn't offend them, but it's the hard message that may offend, but it may also get people to repent and get right with God. Um, ultimately, what really matters is the truth. What does the Bible actually say? And then just preach all of it. Jump down to verse number 9 of Jeremiah 23. This is going to be the, the last scripture that we're, we're looking at tonight is Jeremiah 23. Verse number 9, we're going to kind of read through most of this and then we'll be finished. Verse number 9 says, Mine heart within me is broken because of the prophets. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man and like a man with uh, whom, and like a man whom wine hath overcome because of the Lord and because of the words of His holiness. For the land is full of adulterers. For because of swearing the land mourneth. The pleasant places of the wilderness are dried up and their course is evil and their force is not right. For both prophet and priest are profane. Yea, in my house have I found their wickedness, saith the Lord. Wherefore their way shall be unto them as slippery ways in the darkness. They shall be driven on and fall therein, for I will bring evil upon them, even the year of their visitation, saith the Lord. And I have seen folly in the prophets of Samaria. They prophesied in Baal and caused my people Israel to err. I have seen also in the prophets of Jerusalem an horrible thing. So he's talking about the prophets in Jerusalem. He says, they commit adultery. The prophets, the preachers are up there. And they're committing adultery, he says, and walk in lies. They strengthen also the hands of evildoers, that none doth return from his wickedness. They are all of them unto me as Sodom, and the inhabitants thereof as Gomorrah. When the religious leader, the spiritual leader is up, and they're committing adultery, and they're strengthening the hands of the evildoers. How are they strengthening their hands? By not preaching against it. By not saying, this is wicked, this is evil, this is wrong, you shouldn't be doing this. And tolerating it and accepting it and saying, this is okay. You're strengthening their hands. You're making them stronger. And he says, they walk in lies. 
And we can prove he's strengthening the hands of evildoers by, by not preaching against it. He says that none doth return from his wickedness. Because when you're preaching against it, people are going to be turning from it. Or they should be. Obviously, if they're getting right with God, if they hear the message, then they could turn from their wickedness. And he says, these are some strong words. He says, they are all of them unto me as Sodom. We all know what happened to Sodom. We all know how God felt about Sodom when he rained down fire and brimstone from heaven and completely destroyed it, made it uninhabitable unto this day. This is how God feels against those lying prophets that are afraid that they don't, that either they're afraid, they're doing it for money, whatever their motive is, that they're afraid to preach against the wickedness and they themselves are living a wicked life. Shame on them being in adultery. The, the, the adultery was, was punishable by the death penalty in the Bible. And you're going to have a pastor, a man of God, committing adultery? That's... That's insanity. Let's keep reading. Verse number 15. Therefore thus saith the Lord of hosts concerning the prophets, Behold, I will feed them with wormwood. Wormwood is just like poison, he says. And make them drink the water of gall. For from the prophets of Jerusalem is profaneness gone forth into all the land. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you. They make you vain. They speak, speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say still unto them that despise me, The Lord hath said, Ye shall have peace. And they say unto everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, No evil shall come upon you. These are the lies that the prophets, that, that these lying prophets preach and they prophesy. They don't use the word of God. They, they, they prophesy out of their own hearts and they prophesy a message that says everything is okay. Now, I'm a fan of listening to other preaching. I love listening. I, I go, just on Friday, I was out in, in Gilbert, and I listened to, to a preacher preach there. I like going out whenever I could find other events like that, obviously that aren't coinciding with our church days because I need to be here to preach. But anytime anything else is going on, sometimes on the Internet, I'll find preaching I can listen to. I love listening to it, but we always need to be judging what we hear against the Word of God. Is this prophet prophesying out of his own heart? Is he prophesying lies or is he preaching the word of God? I, I love hearing, you know, sometimes I like hearing preaching where it's, um, I've heard some preachers, they, they really like giving stories and kind of giving some personal testimonies and, and telling all these different events that happen. It's, it's fun to hear that. I like hearing that and sometimes you could learn from that. But what I like way more is someone who might not have the most interesting story to tell, but who really digs into the Bible and, and can teach from God's Word. That's, that's what I like. That, that really um, sticks with me because I, I feel like I'm actually learning a lot when we're getting into a lot of Scripture and we're looking at a lot of, of Bible, of God's Word, and that this is where the focus should be. Um, again, I'm, you know, that's, that's my personal preference. Um, it's still fun to hear the story sometimes, but I like hearing just the meat, potatoes from, from God's Word and just really dig into it and, and see what we could learn. Let's keep reading here. We're almost done. Verse number 18, he says, For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord and hath perceived and heard his word? Who hath marked his word and heard it? Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury. This makes God very angry, by the way, these false prophets that prophesy lies. How would you like if someone was going around, you know, if someone was going around about me saying, oh yeah, Pastor Burson said this, Pastor Burson, and I'm like, I didn't say any of that stuff. That would kind of make me angry. Especially when it's completely opposite of the things that I stand for or things that I believe or whatever. You know, and they're just, just going around and just speaking lies in my name and saying, this is what he said. And I didn't say that. But that's what these prophets do about, about God. Say, oh yeah, God said this, God said that. God, I didn't say that. What are you telling people? Everything's fine. It's not fine. They're going to have judgment coming against them. Why are you telling them this? It makes God angry. It makes them very angry. We're going to see this. Um, it says, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. Verse number 20, the anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days you shall consider it perfectly. I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doing. So God's even saying here is, look, if they would have just spoken my words, if they would have just 
just caused my people to hear what I actually said, they should have turned them from their evil way. But that's not what they did. Verse 23 says, Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, saith the Lord? Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophet said, that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor. As their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal, the prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. Behold, I am against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their lightness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them. Therefore they shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord. There's many places we're warned about false prophets in the Bible. We need to make sure that we are well aware of their existence. Take it seriously because they are dangerous. You know, we read this morning. This morning we talked about um, you shall know them by their fruits. And how people oftentimes like to look at whether or not a person's saved based on their fruits. And I'm not going to re-preach that. That was preached this morning. But <clears throat> the, the context of that verse is talking about people who are false prophets. Again, so this kind of springboard tonight's uh, sermon is, is just like an extension of this morning's sermon where we, we were looking at the fruits of these false prophets. And in Matthew 7, it calls them wolves in sheep's clothing. Right? And that's what the false prophets look like. They look good on the outside. The Pharisees looked good on the outside, but inside they were full of dead men's bones according to Jesus Christ. The false prophet wants to gain your trust. He wants to gain your confidence. He's not going to come out saying, oh yeah, I'm, I, I worship Satan and carry around his, his satanic Bible with him. He's going to be carrying around a King James Bible. He's going to be using the right words, using the right language. And trying to trying to to buddy up with you and gain your confidence, because he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. But his ultimate goal is to destroy. But the Bible says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. So these people expose themselves through the things that they say, which is why it's so important for you individually to make sure you are in this word daily, that you are not deceived, that you can hear what you're saying and say, "That's not right," because I read this for myself. Unfortunately, most people don't take the time to learn God's word for themselves so that when someone comes along, they sound real slick. It sounds like what they're saying is good and I like hearing that and they don't recognize the deceit that's coming out of their mouth because they don't know the word for themselves. Ultimately, we're all responsible. We, again, we, another example we saw in Genesis with Adam and Eve. Now, Eve was deceived by the serpent, right? Serpent lied to her. Satan lied about the Bible, about what God actually said. And he deceived her. And she was tricked. Yet, God still held her responsible. She had the commandment. She had his word. She should have known better. God held her responsible. God holds all of us responsible. We should know better. Now, he also held the serpent responsible for deceiving her. Right? He's going to hold the false prophets responsible. We saw how angry it makes him. But that doesn't excuse you if you're deceived by them. So that's why it's so important for you to take God's word and learn it for yourself on your own so that, that hopefully you don't get deceived by the false prophets that just prophesy deceits and, and speak out of their own heart. But let's uh, bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for um, all the instruction that you give us in your word, dear God. That, that you give us these warnings. Help us to heed these warnings, dear Lord. Help us, to, help us to gain more knowledge and more wisdom by reading your word every single day, dear God, not departing from it and just understanding that there's so much um, strength we could have 
through your word and, and our lives can be led so much better if we just know what you'd have for us to do. And, and we can know that because you've given us your word and you've preserved it for us today. Lord, help us to, to be able to identify the, the wolves in sheep's clothing that are out there, the, the people that just want to prophesy out of their own heart and that don't love the truth, that don't care about what your word says, but they just care about money. Lord, help us to, to not get sucked in to, to that type of a, of a preaching or atmosphere, dear Lord, but that you would guide us into all truth and you would help us to learn and to get right with you, to make the changes necessary, dear Lord, that we can just draw ever closer unto you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.